Welcome to The Feast Life, where we empower you, the modern homeschool mom, to create a life and homeschool you love. One founded on faith, family, freedom, and fun. I'm your host, Julie Ross, creator of the award-winning homeschool curriculum, A Gentle Feast, and a certified Christian life coach. For more information on today's episode and to access my free gift for you, check out thefeastlife.me. Charlotte Mason once said, life should be all living, not a mere tedious passing of time. So on this show, we seek to savor the feast of life. Girl, grab your favorite beverage and pull up a chair. You are welcome at this table. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Feast Life. Today, I'm going to be talking with Ginny Urich from A Thousand Hours Outside. If you haven't heard of this movement, you are certainly going to want to check out this episode and check out all Ginny has to offer on A Thousand Hours Outside. So Ginny is a homeschool mother of five and a founder of this movement about getting children outside. Along with her husband, Josh, she's a full-time creator and curator of the Thousand Hours Outside lifestyle brand, which includes an online store and app and books. She also hosts the Thousand Hours Outside weekly podcast, and she interviews some amazing guests. She is a thought leader in the world of nature-based play and its benefits for children, and she lives with her family in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And in this interview, I talked to Ginny about her new book that just came out called Until the Streetlights Come On. It is a fantastic conversation, and we really highlight some of the research and some of the ideas around building this lifestyle of getting your children outside more. It really encapsulates Charlotte Mason's view of a slow uh, growing time that we can allow our children and then the importance of being out in nature that she talks about. But Ginny really breaks it down into a way that is very motivating with the research that she uses, but also just, she's just such a delight to have a conversation with, and she's such a sweet and humble person. And I really feel like that will come through in this conversation. So let's dive into my interview with Ginny. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Feast Life. I'm your host, Julie Ross, and I am here with the amazing Ginny Urich from A Thousand Hours Outside. And I am so excited that she is here. We were just talking before I hopped on about how I interviewed you back in 2020. And wow. you were saying I was one of the first people to interview you. And I, I mean, was- possibly the first. And I, I think I remember being like, oh my goodness, someone wants to interview. And I was nervous and so honored and so excited. So it's really cool to connect again. Girl, I just have to say, I've been watching you for the past three years and I'm so proud of you and everything that you've built and the message and the way that it's going out into the world. And yes, every time I see you, I'm like, yay, yay, everybody needs to hear what you have to say. And I just am so excited. So my first question kind of relates to that. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you think in the past three years, your message has been so captivating and resonated with so many parents? Mm, I think there's probably a couple of reasons. One is I hit a tipping point. So I've been writing for about 10 years. And at the beginning, it was very hit and miss. We had really little kids, had new babies. And a lot of people were so thrown off by the concept. And I was too. When I first heard that Charlotte Mason said kids should be outside for four to six hours whenever the weather is tolerable, I thought that is the most outlandish idea I have ever heard of in my entire life. Like that is impractical. No one would ever do that. And, you know, then we tried it and we were hooked and we're obviously not outside for four to six hours every day, but um, not even remotely close, but even just that concept of extended nature time. So I think that for a long time, my friends, my family, people are like, that, well, that's a weird idea. No one does that. And then slowly but surely people joined in. And I remember, you know, there was a year where maybe three or four people did it. There was like this woman from Canada named Lindsay and this girl. I mean, I knew them all, you know, it was like this, you know, someone from uh, Virginia and one person from North Carolina. And it was like just us. And we were the only ones. And then slowly but surely, I think it caught on because it it works. If if I'm intentional about getting our family outside, it changes so many parts of family life. It's the answer to like a lot of the problems that we're facing. So I think that that happened. We also hit um, a stage where our youngest was not so young anymore. And I, 
think that that's an important piece too, because when you have really little kids, a lot of times you're very limited in the work that you can put out into the world. And that's okay. That's okay. There is a time for everything. And those early years were not my time. It would have taken too much from my family. I could never have sat for an hour long podcast prior to 2020. Our kids were so clingy. They wouldn't go with anyone. They needed their mom. And so I struggled with that, actually. It was something I struggled with quite a bit because you sort of see other people, they're taking off with their thing or their passion, and I couldn't. And so Mm -hmm. I just had to wait for my time. And in 2020, our youngest was four. And that is, I think, sort of a pivotal age where I could have a little bit more, just a little bit more time to put toward it. And also COVID. I mean, there was that too. So um, people had nothing else to do. (laughs) I was wondering that as well, because I feel like for so many people, that was the tipping point of we're going to go out in nature and we're going to do things as a family because sitting inside all the time, we're literally going to lose our minds. (laughs) Yeah. Like I have nothing else to do. There's no sport. There's no extracurriculars. What can we do? We can go outside and that's it. So I think it was a confluence of those things. And, um, and yeah, it has just grown since and what an honor to play a small role in Mm. the part of these families journeys. I could not be more honored and, and truly humbled. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think you need to realize it's not a small part. You're making a huge impact. And like you said, like the work that you do and getting families outside is changing children. It's changing their family dynamic. It's changing the children's actual like physical brain structure. You talk about this in this new book that we're going to dive into here in a second. Like that is huge, vital, important work that you are doing. And it's so valuable. And I love that you mentioned, you know, Charlotte Mason, obviously I talk a lot about her Mm -hmm. and I think that's why I reached out to you in the first place, because it was like, people read that and they're like, I ain't doing Charlotte Mason. I ain't going outside for four to six hours a day. And it's like, okay, like this is not like a legalistic rule and you must fit your family into this box. What's the most important thing is that are you getting outside? Do you value nature? And so I think her philosophy and the work that you're doing blend so well together Mm -hmm in a way that it makes it very practical for parents to get outside. So it's not this nebulous like thing that we actually might want to do someday, but you actually give like feet to the idea and make it very doable. Thank you. And you know what? I think Charlotte Mason, my first reaction to this concept of being outside, and she has so many beautiful quotes about, you know, giving the work, giving kids work that you know, it's intended for them at this time and put mm. something in front of them that's fascinating and see how quick they are to learn it. I mean, all this beautiful stuff that my initial reaction was one of pushback and my reaction was that's unrealistic. But when you incorporate extended, and I think, you know, when she's talking about four to six hours, what we're talking about is you stay a little bit. You stay maybe Mm -hmm. a little bit longer than you would have otherwise. And you really let your kids dive into their play and you really have that chance to debrief and to exhale, to let your blood pressure go. This is such a message of hope Mm -hmm. to say, look, like let your kids play for four to six hours on one hand could sound dogmatic, but on the other hand, if you take a step back and you really look at it holistically with all the other things she said, this is like a permission slip. Yeah, this is like a yes. permission slip that yes. you don't have to do so much. Yes. You have, I mean, four to six hours is a lot of your day. And if she's yeah. saying, let your kids figure out what to do outside for that amount of time, really mm-hmm. the message is, hey, you can let go a little bit of the control and your kids are still going to thrive. Yes. There's a quote in your book. You quoted Cal Newport, who I love. And one of the things I, okay, one of the things I love about your book is that you, and I put this on Instagram, you have a great balance of research and quotes in personal stories that make it relatable. So oftentimes books are very anecdotal and there's not a lot of support and research. And I'm such a geek. I'm like, I need all the facts. I need all the statistics and the research. And, you know, and then I read other books that are very researchy based and they lose the heart and the message. And so you did a fantastic job of balancing those two. And I love that Charlotte Mason talked about this and the importance of children being out in nature, but she didn't have the science to back it up. But now we do. So in your right. book, you did a great job of bringing in a lot of that modern research to support. She was just a brilliant woman. And yeah, she knew. Time. Yes. But the Cal Newport quote that I love, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on. I'm going to put my glasses on because I am old now. Oh, where was it? Where He was talking about the importance of solitude. Mm. You know what I'm referring to here? 
I'm going to see if I can find it too. Now my I'll brain is. Mine. I this. always, um, I always have sheets of notes and then Cut I out get my lots pause here. Of okay. Found it. Cal Newport informs us everyone benefits from regular doses of solitude. Everyone, you, me, our children, he calls solitude, the school of genius. Even if we are physically by ourselves, we still have to nix the empty distractions. The chatter of the television, the flash of light from our phone announcing a new text or social media comment. Technically, we may be alone, but practically, we are always interconnected in a tangled web of people in business. And it reminded me of the concept that Charlotte Mason talks about of like masterly inactivity and our, the importance of our children being out in nature, but also having time where it's not okay, we're going to be out in nature. And today we're looking at mushrooms and let's all, you know, we're going to, I'm going to read you this book about mushrooms and then we're going to go find one. And then we're going to paint this mushroom in our nature book. Now, there's anything wrong with all of that, but can they be outside with no direction from you or very little, like go over there and find something cool and come tell me about it. Right. I mean, this is the school of genius. I yes. think that if you ask any parent, like, hey, would you like to enroll your child in the school of genius? They would <laughs> probably say yes. And yeah. what is the school of genius? It's exactly what you're talking about. It's like you could even refer to it as that. If that helped you I feel better, yeah. if you are wanting to go outside for a couple hours during your day, whether that's during a school, if you're homeschool, if it's after school, whatever that is, you would say, hey, we're, we're heading to the school of genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's just outside. <laughs> where I don't tell you what to do. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It, it's a freedom to not have to have the pressure to do everything yourself either. Yeah. And, and you learn to trust, right? You learn yeah. to trust your kid. And I think this is a really tricky part. You know, we're, we're vastly, vastly approaching adulthood for our kids. So we're a couple years away, two, two, two and a half years of adulthood. And I think a lot of people really struggle, right? Like all of a sudden this is a big transition, but it doesn't have to be as big of a of a transition if throughout childhood you've given your kids some mm -hmm. control you've given them some autonomy and i do think it's supposed to be this gradual passing of the baton for them to direct their own lives but the problem is, is that when we direct everything they don't have any opportunity to make decisions to find out how they thrive you know to find out what makes them tick what keeps them curious, how they learn, mm -hmm. all of those things, they happen when they're directing it and not us. And so this is really brilliant from Charlotte Mason, isn't it? It's four yeah. to six hours, basically, of letting your kid alone. Yes, and it allows time for those, like talking about the School of Genius, it allows time for all those living ideas, all those wonderful books that you've been reading to your kids, all the music, all the art, all of that needs time to actually grow in the soil of your child's mind. And if you're constantly filling their minds with a million things, I mean, even at the doctor's office, right? Or in the car, like, okay, we're gonna listen to an audio book on the way to the doctor. And then we get to the doctor, I'm gonna pull out your book and we're gonna do that. Like yeah. just time where you can think, but yeah. being out in nature and having that time to think is like a powerhouse combination. And I find that for myself too, but um, so much more. Our kids need that time. I, I'm going to read another quote. This wasn't in your book, but I think it relates to this conversation. It's one of my favorites from Last Child in the Woods that everybody quotes. But mm -hmm. if you're getting our kids out in nature as a search for perfection or as one more chore, then the belief in perfection in the chore defeats the joy. It's a good thing to learn more about nature in order to share this knowledge with children. It's even better if the child and adult go out in nature together and it's a lot more fun. <laughs> And so I think sometimes we can get so serious about it if we're yeah. coming from it from a homeschool perspective, right? And this is a lesson and this is school and we miss out on the joy and the fun of it. And like what you were, you talk a lot about in your book of kind of removing some of that pressure. I felt like for parents of this doesn't have to be perfection, <laughs> like go outside and let it be messy. Can you talk more about that concept? Well, sure. I mean, what's happening is that kids are learning to direct their own lives and they're making their own decisions out there. And that is a really powerful thing. And I like this piece about it going together. All, all of this is well-intentioned, right? Like yeah. all of us are trying to give our kids the best foundation possible for moving forward. So when we tack on this learning objective or that learning objective, this is out of good intentions. You know, we're trying to do the best for our kids that we can, but I think it's misguided because kids can direct a lot of their own learning. And I, one of my favorite quotes is from Angela Hanscom. She wrote the book Balanced and Barefoot. 
Yeah, a phenomenal book, a life-changing book, you know, one I think every single parent should read, Balanced and Barefoot. But one of the quotes she says is, as adults, we think we know best, but she says, a child's neurological system begs to differ. Because when you do take a step back, and I really love John Holt's book, Learning All the Time, how young children learn to read, write, do math, and investigate the world without being taught. When you mm -hmm. do take a step back, especially in the early years, you see that kids learn for mastery, driven all from their own insides, and then they move on to something harder. And they do that year upon year upon year, especially if we continue to give them to time to do that. So what's happening is growth. Growth is happening. You might not be able to measure it. You might not be able to say, well, yesterday they could climb two feet into the tree and today they can climb two and a half feet. You can't measure it, but they are growing. And mm -hmm. what's happening when they're growing in these physical ways is that their brain structure is growing too. This is enhancing the actual wiring in their brain. My favorite quote about that is from Dr. Carla Hannaford who wrote Smart Moves and several other wonderful books. But she said, elderly people who dance regularly have a 76% less chance of developing dementia. That is a that. massive. This is totally a rabbit trail because I have ADHD, but when I, I retire, dance. I want to be a Zumba teacher. That's my goal. So yes, yes. Yeah. I just did Zumba the other night. I'm like, this is what we're supposed to be doing yes, to it. help our brains. Yes. Obviously it helps your body, but to help our yeah. brains. So when you go outside with your kids, we're talking about it being self-structured, they get to structure what they're doing. Their bodies are going to drive them on toward growth and mastery. Don't step in, let them do it because along the way they're, internal things are growing and their bodies are dragging them on, but they're also learning like what it feels like to learn something completely and then move on to something harder. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on there. Yeah. And when they're outside and they're challenging themselves, you know, they're yeah. learning to do hard things and they're learning to take risks. And that applies to academic book work as well, because if you never learn what you're possible of, if you never learn that your body is capable of doing these challenges, then you're not able to have that mental resilience for your schoolwork either. And so, you know, I think um, my one daughter loved to climb trees and she was about nine years old and we're on the playground and I hear this, oh, oh my goodness. and I look and all these parents are around this tree and they're like, that kid is so high. I mean, she had to be like 30 feet up in the air. We were in Colorado at the time. And and I was like, whose kid is that? Whose kid is that? Oh, no. Like, oh, no. Oh, no. That's I when I don't, don't volunteer. I, don't <laughs> I would do the same <laughs> as you. Right? I would but blame I my friend. Like, if I out, she would freak out. Yeah. Everything in me was freaking out, right? Especially the parent. They weren't helping my situation. But I was like, <laughs> she has to learn how to get down by herself. Yes. Because that's the lesson is... I want to let's camp here. We have down. to camp here. We have to camp here because this is such a big this is such a big deal. She wasn't two when she climbed into the oh, yeah, right. 30 feet, right? She's not two. This yeah. happens in small steps. Kids grow and what they learn is they learn what their bodies are capable of. Mm -hmm. Risk is actually a calculation that we calculate so fast in our brains. It's a calculation of how dangerous is it and how likely is it to happen. And so if you let a small child play near a body of water, play near the road, well, how dangerous is that extremely? How likely is something to happen extremely? We don't do that. But how dangerous is it for a small child to maybe climb up one rung on a tree or climb up onto a log and try and balance. Well, it's not very dangerous at all. It's very likely that they may slip and fall and you're going to have to put a Band-Aid on it and you're going to have to hold them while they cry for five minutes. But what's happening is that they are learning in their own body how to determine how risky it is. And mm. if you don't give them the opportunities to do that, they're not ever going to know. They're not going to be able to make the calculation themselves because they've never had the opportunity to do it. So we cannot be the one that is always managing and calculating the risk. They have to do it. And what is so cool is that kids grow little by little and little Little by little, they're maybe a little further off the ground. Little by little, they climb a little bit higher, but it doesn't happen all at once. It's this small progression and they learn those skills. They learn how to test the branches. They learn how to get up and get back down and all of that happens in small increments and we are passing the baton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, it. yeah, you have to see where your child's at, right? And kind of extend the circle of safety and the things that they're learning. Yeah. But I think it's, I'm so glad we're talking about this because I feel like 
parents in today's society, they feel the need to protect their kid from everything. And so yeah. they don't want them to, to, maybe they might fall if they go one more rung up and they think they're capable. You don't think they're capable, you know, and allowing, I feel like you and your message and your book do a very good job of giving parents research to go know that you have to let this happen. And this isn't just something I'm saying, like, this is why. And I think the why is so important. And you do a very good job in the book of providing the why for so many things about being outside and the way you do it. One of the things I thought was really um, relevant. So we're recording this in November and it'll air really soon too. Um, but talking about the time change <laughs> and about <laughs> You talk in the book about artificial light and the rhythms of light. And I was reading it and I was laughing because I have been so messed up this week since the time change of my sleep <sighs> rhythms and waking up. And I'm like, ah, so can you talk I about thought it was over of, of I every single year I hear like they got rid right. of it and then it still happens. <laughs> what yes. is happening here? <laughs> oh, I feel you. Yeah. So can you talk about this concept of light, artificial plus the natural light and how important that is for our kids? Absolutely. This is something I had no idea existed until a few years ago. My midwife actually had told me about it years ago. She would say things like, if you get your kids outside before noon, they'll sleep better at night. And I just remember thinking that doesn't make any sense. So I didn't pay any attention at all. But in the last couple of years, I've actually seen a bunch of the research and read all of these books that talk about how light is not only for our vision. And that is what I would have thought. That's the purpose of light. It's so that we can see. But there is a very big difference between full spectrum sunlight and a light bulb. And especially these days, the light bulbs used to, and mm -hmm. I think they were maybe more dangerous, they weren't as energy efficient or whatever. The light bulbs used to simulate more of the curve, the natural curve of full spectrum sunlight, and mm -hmm. now they don't. The light is like peaking at different colors. It's pretty interesting to learn about. Yeah. But full spectrum sunlight is a wave and it includes all the colors and it changes throughout the day. It's meant to be a guide for our physiology. Mm -hmm. It's meant for you to see, yes, but also this is meant to guide your body. So one thing that happens when you go outside in the morning, you're exposed to bright light and it's measured in terms of lux. Lux, one lux is one candle worth of light. and the lux is in the thousands, even if it's cloudy. If it's sunny, it's going to be in like the tens of thousands. But if it's cloudy, it might be 4,000, 5,000. You can actually measure it. You can buy a meter. I think there's apps on the phone. That's cool. You can see how much light is coming through, full spectrum light. Inside, even in a bright room, even with the window open, you know, are the numbers are in the hundreds, four, mm -hmm. five, six hundred, eight hundred. It's not enough to trigger your body to know it's the daytime. Yeah. And what happens when you get that trigger is that your brain releases uh, serotonin, which helps you feel good. You got happy kids, you got a happy parent, <laughs> you feel good. Later on in the day, that serotonin turns into melatonin, makes you sleepy. That's why if we're outside for these long days, you know, it's like at night, you just, you fall asleep so quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it's helping to reset all these internal body systems. There's over 100 internal body systems that are dependent on the day and night cycle. So if you can get outside during the day, it's just helping to reset those body systems and to help them to operate on the cycle that they're meant to. You just feel better. It does so much for you beyond the vision piece. Yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the dangers then of, I know you talked in there about the blue light that we get from our phones and our devices and those kind of things. Well, right. Cause the blue light. So in the morning light is more blue light maybe than the other colors. It's something mm -hmm. like that. Right. So the blue light is meant to wake you up. Blue light is like, Hey, kickstart the day. Well, if you have, and then it changes and you see the colors of the day change. So like at night, it's like these purples and it's like, it's meant to like put your body to sleep. It's just this beautiful rhythm of color and day to night, this transition, but the computers and your phones emit a lot of blue light. And that is the wavelength that wakes you up. So yeah. that's why everyone always says either to buy those blue light blacker glasses, which I've read back and forth, how helpful they are. Are they, I don't know, um, somewhat. Some people say they aren't, but the fact that if, especially your kids, if they're playing video games late at night or they're on their screen late at night, that is, is going to throw their sleep off. Yeah. Yeah. No, I even noticed that as an adult as well. I cannot have anything within like an hour of going to bed as a book, <laughs> yeah. but no light there. Um, I feel like you did a very good job in the book too, of balancing screens versus outside it's not this is the enemy <laughs> right this is here this is staying 
So right. how do we approach it in a way that makes sense? Can you kind of describe your kind of philosophy on screen time as well? Well, we're just so imbalanced. So yeah. that's it. We have video games in our home and televisions, and we also have computers. So, and my husband and I have a phone and our oldest son has a phone too. So, you know, we, we have the screens. The issue yeah. is that the statistics are the kids are outside for four to seven minutes playing freely. They are a far cry from Charlotte Mason's ideal. Yeah. They are playing on screens for four to seven hours. So this is the problem. The problem is that we are massively imbalanced. It's not even like it's close and we need a little tweak. Like we yeah. need a lot of tweaking here for our kids because when kids play outside and when they play in general, if they're playing inside, that also is really beneficial for them. If they're off screens, if they're doing hands-on things, they're building with their Legos or they're building with blocks or they're reading or they're playing games, anything that's imaginative, they're playing pretend with their dolls, things like that. This is enhancing their brain function. We've talked about that already, but it's also enhancing their social skills, their emotional skills, their physical bodies. And so all of these things are happening when kids play. And the biggest problem, I think, obviously there's issues with screens and kids can see content that is beyond their years or things that maybe we wish that they wouldn't have seen. There can be cyberbullying. There's like obviously some risk there, but I think the biggest risk is how much time it takes away from these things that kids need to develop who they are. Mm -hmm. And so if so much time is going to screens, they're not getting the downtime, they're not getting the margin, they're not getting the time to be creative and innovative and bored so that they can figure out what to do with their time. They're not getting any of that. And that really affects their development in the long run. Today's episode is brought to you by A Gentle Feast. A Gentle Feast offers a complete living books curriculum, an award-winning early reading program and more tools to equip you to apply Charlotte Mason's timeless philosophy into your modern homeschool. Go to agentlefeast.com to check it out. Smooth and easy days are closer than you think. Yeah, for sure. And you gave, you gave such good research that I think is really helpful for parents just to know. I mean, I just think you don't know what you don't know sometimes, right? <laughs> And so you give um, a lot of data that's very helpful to kind of go, okay, no, this is why this is important. It's not like you can't have them. It's not like you can never use them. It's that finding that balance, but it gives some of that motivation because it is hard yeah. to balance that. Yes, you do need motivation. So let's talk about two. Here's two yeah. that I go back to a lot. One is called distance. They both come from Katie Bowman, who is the founder of Nutritious Movement. She's got some really cool books. One is called Grow Wild. I think she's got like 10 books. They're all good. Two things that she says. One is we need distance looking. So distance looking is when you're outdoors. You can't have distance looking inside. <laughs> and what happens when you're inside or you're doing near work, reading, or you're in an enclosed space, your eyes are always constricted. Mm. Like if you were to lift weights and your bicep would be tense, whatever, your this ring around your eyes called the ciliary ring is always constricted, even when you're sleeping. So the only time that your eye relaxes is when you are engaged in distance looking, that's it. So kids are really struggling with their eyesight and short sightedness is on the rise because kids are not getting a chance to look at things that are far away. So mm -hmm. that's one small thing. It's like, hey, are we going to have some distance looking today? I mean, it's silly, yeah. but it is actually a thing. And another thing she talks about is when kids jump and land, which this is a natural inclination of a child. You know, I remember our kids when they were real little, they're going to step up on a curb and jump off of it. And then it gets a little higher and higher. They're going to go up on a hay bale and jump off. Well, every time they hit the ground and have impact is building their skeletal systems. So Katie Bowman says osteoporosis is a childhood disease that shows up in adulthood. And so I need, I have to have those reminders because this concept is simple. The concept of getting outside for longer periods of time is a simple one. It is not easy to implement and it is not easy to save the time for it in a world that offers so much to our kids. And so for me, I continue to read about it. Now we've been living this way for 12 years and have been researching it for almost just as long. I continue to read about it because I continue to need to have small reminders that this is a worthy use of our time. Yes, I love that. And you would think that you wouldn't need more motivation. 
like you you interview so many amazing people on your podcast and you read all these amazing books like if anybody you would think like like you'd be good but I think that's such a good point is that we have to constantly be reminding ourselves of our why Mm -hmm. and then being purposeful and intentional because I always say to people about anything that you want to do whatever your values are if not going to magically find time (laughs) and so if you don't purposely schedule time for being out in nature and making it happen it's not going to be like one day you have all this day. Now, I think you need that flexibility. And you talk about that in your book too, about scheduling time in nature, being intentional, but also being flexible. It's like, okay, today we're all loading up in the car. Let's go. You know? And I think that's really key because you, you, you want that balance as well, but you talk about scheduling times out in nature. And I wanted to read this quote, but in it, you mentioned that while I'm looking for the quote, you talk about um, that you called it carrot day and okay. You have to explain that. <laughs> Well, I just, I thought it was everyone so cute, always but I was like, parents. I know what this means. <laughs> I thought I said it doesn't mean anything except that we were trying to name our little nature group and like everyone always brought carrots to eat and it just ended up with that. It has oh, no okay. significant meaning sense. other than that. That was it. Okay. <laughs> I, love no that. I should make up a story though. I probably should make up a story that's better than that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me, let me read your quote and then I want to tell you what I thought it meant. Okay. So having a regular nature day each week is a foundational pillar you can fall back on, giving you and your family a much needed sense of rhythm and predictability to your years. It gives you something to look forward to a day in which you know you can deeply exhale and let the weight of the world slide off your shoulders. Don't discount flexibility. But if you can find another family who has some similar open spaces in their calendar, look ahead and snipe the nicest days of the week to get outside and play. We keep a small seasonal list of favorite places in our areas, and we try to knock them out each year. Friday has been our long-standing nature club day. For us, ours is oddly called Carrot Day, and I highly recommend naming yours, but we've had some grand adventures on a whim during the in-betweens. So it's scheduling the time out in nature, having like a weekly routine, and I think that's so important. Finding other families is huge because... I don't know about you, but like, if I'm going to do anything, I need accountability. Like I will not go to the gym if I'm not meeting my trainer or a friend. I just won't. (laughs) And the other thing too, is the kids don't want to go. And I think that's a really important piece. You know, people ask all the time, oh, your kids must love to go outside and they don't, they don't. And neither do I. I love to be outside. I love to be outside. Thank you, Jenny, for being honest. Wait, mic drop. Let's just take a moment here. You mean you do something because it's important, even if you don't like it? And I like it once I get there. Yes. But the, but the yes, act, yes. the After act the of gym, actually, I'm like, hallelujah, that was awesome. Like getting there. Yeah. Yeah. All the, every time. I mean, I think the gym is, is very similar. It is every morning, every morning. If that alarm clock goes off at five 30, every single time you're like, uh, and then every yeah. single time after you're like, yes, you're yeah. so glad that you did it. And it is actually a really similar thing. I love this book by Alistair Humphreys. He called the doorstep mile. And it comes from a saying, like it wasn't actually his saying, some Norwegian saying or something, but the hardest, the hardest mile is that mile across your doorstep that those, those are the hardest times. And so friends make all the difference in the world. My kids do not want to go unless there's friends coming. And if there's friends coming, they absolutely want to go. It changes the entire thing. So if you can have a group of friends, when our kids were little, we had, you know, a a rhythm to it, Mm -hmm. but because we were more under scheduled, we also had flexibility to it. So depending on where you live, like we're in Michigan, it's November, it's pretty cold already. But every once in a while in November, there'll be a day that's 70 degrees. And in Michigan, kids swim in that weather. So we would go to the beach. But you can't do that if you if you're like, well, we're gonna miss this and we're gonna miss that. We can't. We're that so as especially as young children, it's a little harder as they get older because they do have their interests and their things that they do, which is another point. Like when your kids are young, it's That's so hard important. physically, but you tend to have a little bit more time. The perfect time, it never arrives. So you just do it. Do it in the season that you're in. Find the time in the season that you're in. Put in the effort in the season that you're in. But when you have less scheduled, there's more flexibility to say, this is a beautiful day. The leaves are changing. It's a random warm day in the middle of this month, and we're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. I like your idea too, about having a list of places or a list of specific seasonal things that you might want to do in your area. So I always try to schedule ours out like at the beginning of the month, because if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. And I need to look around and go, okay, well, we've never been to this park yet, or we never been here. And like, if I don't put it on the schedule or even pay for something sometimes like, oh, I'm going to pay for a canoeing trip at this place because we've never been to this park. Like if I pay for it, we're going to, it's going to happen. 
Okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's raining, we have bad attitudes, we are going to this thing. So it's the schedule part, but then also having the flexibility. And what you said was so important is you can't have flexibility if you're over scheduled. And you talk about this in the book. And I think it's so important. I want to highlight this is I love that you create this beautiful picture of a slow and sacred childhood mm-hmm. and valuing this kind of Charlotte Mason uses the phrase like the slowing, growing, slowing, growing time that they have. And we don't allow our kids and our culture to have that slow growing yeah. time, especially when they're very young. So can you talk about some of that concept of overscheduling flexibility and how important that is to get outside? Yeah. Well, well how did she know everything? I know, right? <laughs> I think truth be told, none of these other books ever needed to be written. If people right. wanted to read <laughs> Jonathan Mason's book, she, she just knew it all. But this is a different way of approaching childhood, right? The mm-hmm. I think the mainstream approach to approaching childhood, and I used to be a teacher, and I talk about this a little bit. You know, I was definitely in the school system when kindergarten in our area went. I mean, kindergarten used to be a half day. You know, yeah, you I, I, taught, I, I actually taught half day kindergarten. Yes. And okay. I loved, I mean, I loved half day kindergarten. It was so it was fun. Like you, we had cookies you, and melting. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. You hugged the teacher, you painted at the easel, you played outside, and then you hugged the teacher and you went home. I mean, that was like all that it was. And you were home by lunch. And so kindergarten became full day uh, in Michigan. And I don't quite know how it happened around the country, but it came in, I think, 2008. And I was just privy to those behind the scenes conversations because of my position in the school system. And the problem is, is that it's become so academic and the kids did not have downtime woven in and the teachers were begging for it. And in the end, it just went to more academics and more programs and more adult directed things. And so this is the mainstream of how we're raising kids is filling all the time and telling them what to do. And even when I've substitute taught, I substitute taught in kindergarten once, and maybe because it was a substitute lesson plan, Julie, it was like time to the minute. Oh my. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> it's 8.56. So now we're going to sing this song. And yeah. now it's 8.59 and we are <laughs> going to cut this piece of paper. I mean, it was to the minute. And this is this is a lot of pressure for kids. I remember Angela Hanscom, who wrote that Balanced and Barefoot book, she said one time she went to, I think, a middle school and her her whole plan was to stay for like the whole day and just kind of really get a feel for what's going on in the school. And she said she could not stay for longer than half the day. She said her brain was totally fried from sitting and being in the situation. And it was so awful. Like her body felt so awful. She like left. She she couldn't take it. It was one day. Well, when I left the public school, I was doing tutoring. And I lived out was- outside of Washington, D.C. at this time. And this family hired me to be a tutor for their five-year-old. And I was thinking, okay, they need help with reading or something like that. And I went over there and I was one of four tutors that this five-year-old had. And I was talking to him and I'm like, what do you like to do? And he goes, well, I don't really have time to do anything. And I was like, well, you know, maybe if we finish our lesson, then we can play. And he was like, well, what is that? Like he had no concept and it broke my heart I actually got fired after like a month because I was letting him play for the last five minutes of uh, we play together and build stuff, you know, and I'm like, this kid is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and I had never been in that world to see yeah. the high pressure academics. And I know that through your research and people you interview, you probably have way more expertise, but that was such a sh- eye opening experience of, wow, this actually exists. And yeah. I think most of us aren't to that extreme. Right. Right. But for a lot of us, especially us homeschoolers, it's, can I have the faith and the courage like Charlotte Mason talks about to go outside and play? Because sometimes yeah. it takes faith to go, it's going to be okay. And we yeah, I can't check in, it. I can't check it play. off. And I tell you what, that's a family that loved their kid. They love their kid, but they were severely misguided. Our youngest. So if we talk about, let's talk about like the slow growth, right? Yeah. So this Dr. Carl Hannaford, who wrote the book with the dancing quote, Uh, the dancing statistic. She is in her 80s. She didn't learn to read till she was 10 years old. And so we got parents that are listening, right? 10 years old. I mean, that feels 
pretty old. That's like a fourth grader, right? Mm -hmm. Or third grader. And if your child did not read until they were in the fourth grade, you would feel so shaky as a parent mm -hmm. these days. But she said back then it didn't matter. And she's gone mm -hmm. on to become a PhD. And I think that the, um, what I've read is that the average age for learning how to read is three to 12. Wow. Three to 12, four lifespans. Wow. I mean, I mean, that's a lot, right? Like if you're three, I mean, it's you're four times older if you're 12, you know, and and that's all considered in the realm of normal. And so that is the mm -hmm. slow growth that we're talking about. It's really the growth that's at the child's pace. And so for all of our kids, we haven't started any formal instruction until they're seven. And mm -hmm. that was mainly just because we had a lot of kids that were close in age and I couldn't do it. It wasn't actually what I wanted to do. <laughs> I wanted to really be in control. I wanted to check off all the learning objectives, but we just happened to be in this situation where I was like, oh, I got a baby and a toddler and another toddler and a five-year-old. So I can't, like I can't do. And so I latched on to some of these other philosophies like the Waldorf and what they do in Finland. And they wait mm -hmm. in Charlotte Mason, they allow these early years to be these slow growing years. And I did this, Julie, our youngest, um, I don't think we're gonna have any more kids. So she's our youngest. And for the other kids, I waited till they were seven. And then I did this teach your child to read in a hundred easy lessons and it's worked for our kids. And I know I'm not trying to say that this is the approach for every child, because if your child is dyslexic, there's certain things where sometimes you have to have more early intervention. So what I'm not saying is that this is the approach for every kid, but this is what we did in our family and the hundred easy lessons worked really well. And they all learned to read within a couple of months and went from being illiterate to reading chapter books. Okay. At age seven yeah. for our youngest, I had read that book by John Holt that said kids can learn to read on their own. And I thought, I'm going to give it a go because if it doesn't work, yeah. I can always fall back on that book that yeah. did work for the other kids. And so she is seven years old and I did not teach her formally how to read and she can sit down and read a book just yesterday. I mean, she sits down, she's got the little critter book and the way that it happened is we read a lot together and then she was internally motivated to want to read because it's fun to be able to read and we're sounding out her name because she wants to do those types of things and eventually she asked enough questions yeah. where she figured it out on her own mm -hmm. and it's such a different approach to childhood that like when we talk about the slow growth that is really what i would think of as slow growth which is we can live we can love we can have a great today and I'm not putting learning objectives necessarily on a timeline for mm. each particular child and letting yeah. it unfold as it comes. And I think that's okay. And yeah. I think it works. I mean, oh. I, you know, like I said, there's going to be certain circumstances where a family is going to have to approach it in a different way due to certain circumstances, but you know that too. And mm -hmm. you also, I think as a parent, get to choose and it's hard it's hard because if you have a child that doesn't learn to read till until they're 10 good for you parent for letting them be on their timeline but you i know you're going to get a lot of flack for that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well even just the the lifestyle that you talk about in your book i think you get a lot of you can get a lot of flack for that you have to be prepared yeah. for that because it's like wait your kids aren't involved in 17 activities and you know your family is yeah outside doing whatever that can yes you're yes, going it to has, it has the choice. right yeah. it has the appearance of irresponsibility and i think that's the key mm -hmm. it's but it's only the appearance of irresponsibility yeah. it is it's one of masterly the most, inactivity yeah I, it I is made one of the most purposely. responsible things mm -hmm. it's why yeah. your book is so important because then you can start quoting statistics <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, this is why we made that choice. And I think that's why yeah. I really recommend your book is because it will give you though that motivation and it will give you that research to back up. This is why we made that choice. If it's the choice that you make, but it opens the door to that conversation. Is this a lifestyle that we value that we think is important that because you do have to make sacrifices in one area or another. Yeah. You're always making sacrifices as a parent. So it's like, what path do we feel like is going to be the most beneficial for our childhood? And it's this one, but um, yeah. And one of the sacrifices, okay, Julie, and if we're going to be honest, one of the sacrifices is our ego. 
And I think it's an important thing to talk about. I really love this book by Linda Flanagan called Take Back the Game about youth sports. And she, she is the only author where she's talked very candidly about when my kid scores a goal or my kid is a superstar on the sports team, that gives me value. Oh, wow. Yes. And when our kids read at four, yes. that gives us value. Yes. And when our kid is a first chair violin, that mm -hmm. gives us value. Now, if this is something that they love and that they're driven yes. to do, right. then go for it. Yes. But if you know, if we're honest, and if some of the purpose is for our own gratification or our own ego, that's something that we have to often put aside for the sake of having the slow growing years. But that's so hard. <laughs> so hard. And it gets hard to admit that to yourself and be right. self-aware enough to even see what you're doing. Yeah. And so if you're sacrificing that and you're following this path of we're allowing our children these years to grow slowly to have time we're not going to fill our days up with so many things so that we can spend time outside because we do really value it we see the neurological benefits and i love that you bring in all the neuroscience and all that thing this is this is actually preparing our children for a better future to have this time outside as a child so if we're going down this path that can give you the motivation and the knowledge to be able to deal with some of the, the ego things because it's like, yeah, well, we made mud pies today. <laughs> well, and here's, let's, here's a full circle thing. I mean, this may be what is actually happening in the rat race. The, the problem is, is that we overschedule. Mm -hmm. And because we overschedule, we have nothing that we do. And that's another thing that Linda Flanagan talks about in her book, Take Back yes, the Game. I am passionate about this as a life coach is moms. Yes. That's for them too. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is the rat way. So she says, how are we presenting adulthood? We're presenting adulthood mm -hmm. that it's this big bore that all I do is drive you around every or single day. And all right? I do, like... yes, is sit on the sideline. She says in like the fetid hot experience. I mean, you know, it's funny. She writes funny. But I think that then the rat race or the cyclical part is, well, if that's all you're doing, then that's all you can ever hang your hat on. And so mm -hmm. it facilitates this over enmeshment, this, mm -hmm. the, the ties are too tight between yeah. what our kids, how they're performing and our self-worth. But if you have some of your own things, because you have a little bit more space in your time, and sometimes you cross stitch, or you go to the gym with your friend, or you manage to get out for tea or coffee once or twice a month or whatever you have a, an actual hobby that you do you play on a team or you whatever like then there's not quite so much pressure to find your self-worth in the mm. accolades of your kids yes it's so key it's a gift not just for your kids not to be over scheduled but it's a gift for you as well i love that you yeah. brought that up and charlotte mason talks about that how like moms when their children are in like their young adult years don't have anything left to give them because they gave all of themselves when they were younger and the mom didn't continue to grow as the kids continued to grow. Okay, and which book? Wait, I, I need to read quote. this. I will send it to you. I'll put it in the show notes. It's so powerful because it was like, when I read that, I mean, I was doing that and I thought it was, Charlotte Macy even says, we, we do it like a martyr. We think we're doing the right yeah. thing for our kids, but we're actually doing them a disservice because when they get to be young adults, we don't have anything left to offer them because we didn't grow our minds and our bodies and our souls as we were trying to feed so much into them. And so um, not having- Whoa. Isn't that awesome? Whoa. <laughs> well, what is so bizarre to me is that then she had insight. I mean, this is one of the things that I talk about with my friends is that there's a lot, I think, of information out there about parenting, like parenting your infant. And, you know, there's so many books, but your newborn and then this stage and you can get a text that comes every week and this is their developmental, right? But then when you approach those years of like transitioning into adulthood, I don't think there's quite as much information out there. And I had a friend who told me, I love this uh, author, Pam Lobley, she said that part of the reason that there's not quite so much information is because no one feels like they could write about it because it's their kids' personal information, right? Yep. Like the That's 20 year old is not going to be like, sure, mom. When they were younger. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there's not as much information out there. But how wild that Charlotte Mason, she like spanned the whole gamut. <laughs> she like knew about that and this and when they're getting older and when your kids are, you know, out on the out in the world. What, what I have woman. loved about this approach and this lifestyle is because 
it has shaped me as a person. Yeah. I have changed so much from my time outside and from my time out in nature. Yes. I, I'm really great and glad it's doing stuff for my kids. <laughs> But really yeah. what motivates me and what has made the biggest impact is how it has shaped me as a person. I will literally like slide off the side of the road now to be like, oh my goodness, let's go look at these flowers. Or, you know, I, other day I was joking, yeah. I'm really turning it into an old person because I was like bird watching the other day and I was trying to find my binoculars and I saw a bald eagle. The oh, other day up in North Carolina, wow. I was up there and we were staying out in the woods and I saw, I, I've never seen one in real life. It was so gorgeous. Wow. And wow. I was like, I would have missed all this stuff before because I was so focused oh. on work and achieving and all these other things that until I started embracing this lifestyle, it was like, yeah, I have changed as a person too. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's so and that thing. is, that is a really important point because what's different between now and generations past is that, um, obviously kids are playing outside less. Everybody knows that, but what is changed if you adopt this slower lifestyle is that you as a parent get to play more and that is a piece that did not exist so when we talk about you know like people always are like, things weren't all that great back then you know you're, you're picking and choosing what you want to take and it's like well i want to take the part where kids had more autonomy they got to play with their friends more i want to take that but mm -hmm. i don't want to take the part where all the parents just stayed inside i was just gonna say that because i grew up in the 70s where it was like like your title of your book stay outside till the street lights come on Mm -hmm. Then you can come, you know, like come back in. That's what my parents told me. They're like, you can come yeah. in when it's dark. <laughs> and so we would play outside for hours and drink from the water hose. And we'd like, we we're like scavengers in people's houses trying to find food, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, survival of the fittest. But my parents never came with me. Right. I never saw them embracing it or valuing it right. as something important. It was just kind of like, well, that's what go away kids, you know, and we're going to yeah. have our like card party and you all go do something else. And so I'm yeah. so glad you brought that up because it's one thing to be like, okay, kids go play outside. And it's a whole nother thing to value it and make it a priority for yourself as well. And I wanted to end with this quote that you ended your book with. You wrote, it's never too late. It's easy to believe we've run out of the time needed to make a difference. But creativity starts flowing almost immediately when we have nothing to do. Boredom is a state our brains and bodies want to flee from. So when we remove stimulation, we've created fertile soil for imagination. We can begin today by carving out a small window of time that allows for self-direction and see where it goes. And I think that was such a word of hope for parents who might be like, well, it's too late. I have older kids mm -hmm. or we're all addicted to screens or our lives are already all too overscheduled. Like I can't do this lifestyle now. And mm -hmm. I want to encourage you. And I want to hear from you as well that, yeah, it was so key that you said that it's never mm -hmm. too late. This isn't for starting when your kids are two, you can start when they're right. 12. Yes. Yes. And you just say, look, we're going to take 20 minutes tonight where no one has their screens out. We're going to play a card game or we're going to go on a walk around the neighborhood and see what we see. And I think what happens is, basically what happened in my story, which is you try it once and you realize there's a lot of value here. There's a lot of life that is happening here. And slowly but surely you can increase your time. And I think sometimes we might be scared to give so much time to something, but maybe it's a weekend or during your school day, when you give kids a larger, a little bit larger period of time, that really allows them to dive into their play. So that Angela Hanscom, once again, going back to her, she says it can take up to 45 minutes for a kid to even develop what they're going to play. They're mm -hmm. figuring out what are we going to do? Oh, who's going to be what thing? And we're playing pretend. So if we schedule things sort of like American culture does and everything is 45 minutes or less, recess is 45 minutes or less, you know, this play date is 45 minutes or less, it's an hour. You never really get to that payoff mm. and you have to be able, and that's why I think Charlotte Mason is so brilliant. It's like, you, if you're gonna put in the effort to call up a friend and to meet at the park and to pack up your snacks, get the payoff. Yes. And the payoff happens a couple hours in. That's where the payoff mm -hmm. happens. And so, and that's what makes your life feel more enhanced and more fulfilled. So, you know, yeah, you can start small, see what it feels like, and then try it. Give it a shot. One three hour chunk outside. How does it go? And and you go from there. We have had one, we have been doing this for 12 years, and we had one bad experience where we came home because it was just too cold and the wind was whipping and we had little kids and they all started crying and it was like bitter cold with the wind and we turned around and came home that's it one time wow. every other one every other one 
12,000 hours outside, I have come back and been like, I'm so glad I did that. Yes. Yeah. The, I like that you raised the point of a larger chunk of time. Starting small is great with anything, but I, I do agree with you that stuff like this, and I feel like that with my own life as well, when I'm working, you quoted Cal Newport in your book, his book, Deep Work, talks about this concept. Yeah. If I'm doing creative work, I block off s- several hours of time because it will take me two hours or so for my brain to start getting into that creative flow. If I'm making a new product or I'm coming up with a new coaching program, like I can't do that in a 30 minute time block that I have. Yeah. Like I can answer emails or something that doesn't require a lot of creativity, but our kids need that because that creative imagination takes time to develop. So that yeah. bigger chunk and schedule it. Otherwise- it ain't gonna happen. You're never gonna have three extra hours, right? That's right. That's right. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Where can everyone get in touch with you and get your book? And when does it come out? I can't remember. It comes out in in like a couple days on November 14th. So whenever this goes, it might already be out. It's called Until the Streetlights Come On. It's available, they say, wherever books are going to be sold. Yeah. Maybe it'll be in a store. I don't know. Like, those are the things you don't really know. I, I guess saw your book like- at this little tiny coffee shop when I was up in Hot Spring, North oh, Carolina. That is so, so, so book. cool. That's I, I so cool. I'm to take a picture and send it to you, but I was oh. like, oh. What a thrill. That is a total thrill. And then our website is 1000hoursoutside.com. What you can find there are these tracker sheets that are free to download and they're really cool. There's 15 or 16 different designs where you can actually keep track of your time outside and celebrate it. The point is to celebrate it, not to say I only got this far. Is the point is always, oh, look at how much of childhood we saved mm-hmm. this year. You know, was it 400 hours, is it eight, whatever it is, yeah. you know, you saved that amount of childhood. So that's meant to be a modeling tool for our little bit older kids and just for a celebration. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of stuff there, kickoff pack with hiking prompts. And then we have an app too, the 1000 hours outside app. People sometimes like to keep track of their time outside that way. Like even my dad does it, <laughs> it's into little badges. So that's oh, kind of fun. So. Everything is just kind of 1,000 hours outside because I'm not super creative. <laughs> no, smart. It makes it way easier for people to find things. And I love it. I love everything that you offer. It's so good. And just some of like your kits and tools just to make it easy. You need to make this easy. If you make this complicated, yeah. like have the stuff ready to go. Have packs, yeah. you know. One year for mm-hmm. Christmas, I bought my kids all those like camelback backpacks and compasses and binoculars yeah. and things. So it's like, we didn't have to go hunting for everything. Every time we wanted to go somewhere, just grab the bags, make it so easy because this is so important. The little trackers are so cute. And I feel like that with anything, anytime you're starting a new habit, you need a visual, you need a tracker sure. to help motivate you. So I love that. Yes, you, you heard it from a life things. coach. You heard, you heard it right here from a life coach. The visual helps. <laughs> yeah. It really does. Absolutely. One on first set. Well, thank you so much for your time. I love you so much. This was a wonderful Aww. conversation. Oh, it was just such a treat. It's like it came full circle, you know, <laughs> that we, we connected so many years ago. And I'm so grateful that you had. Um, and I had can't wait back. for everyone to get your book. It is so, 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 so important. So thank Thanks. you for doing it. Hey, I just wanted to pop in here and thank you for listening to today's episode. I have a very special announcement. In January, I'm going to be launching a new course, The Confident Homeschool Mom, and I would love for you to join me. If you would like to get on the wait list for this course, you can go to thefeastlife.me forward slash join, and then you'll get all the information about the course when it's released and be able to get an early bird discount. So once again, that's thefeastlife.me forward slash join. I can't wait to start this in January and I hope that you'll be able to join me.